Welcome. This video is the second part of my exploration of the low speed aerodynamics of slender delta wings. In the first part, I discuss the historical and technical context for this study. In this video, I will show you how I set up and ran a CFD analysis, then validated my results against established experimental and theoretical results. Before we jump in, a quick reminder to like, subscribe, and share my content, as well as to support me on Patreon. All right, this video is super exciting, so let's just jump straight in. Part one, case setup. Here are the boundary conditions used for the simulations. My inlet and outlet specifications are a bit strange, but this was done so the same mesh could be used for the range of angles of attack explored. The first boundary condition was a velocity inlet, then a pressure outlet, slip walls for the domain, and finally a no slip wall for the wing. Here you can see the simulation and solver parameters I specified. I'm often asked about why I chose the turbulence model that I do, so let me give a short explanation. In short, the K Omega SST model is very good at modeling the flow close and far from the wall. Instead of spending 20 minutes on the subject, I'm just going to link to a video in the description. If you want to learn more, please watch the video. It is by another channel that is extremely clear and high quality. As a matter of fact, I would recommend all of his videos. To calculate my turbulent inlet conditions, I just found a quick online calculator by the aforementioned channel. When running a CFD simulation, it is important to do a mesh refinement or mesh convergence study. This basically consists of running a bunch of cases with progressively finer meshes until your results begin to converge towards some value. For my results, you can see that they converge between 4 and 13 million cells, so I ran all of my following simulations at around 6.8 million cells or case 11. Just a quick note that a mesh refinement study isn't sufficient to say that your results are valid. It only indicates that your results are independent of your mesh. To validate your results, you should compare them to experimental and or theoretical results. To determine when to stop each simulation, I monitored the force results in pair view while they were running. Once I noticed that the force was not changing over a few hundred iterations, I terminated the calculation and recorded my results. Part two, running the cases. Here are the steps I used to set up and run the cases. This may seem somewhat confusing, but the idea was to minimize the number of times I needed to create the mesh. The mesh creation is a fairly large computation, so I prefer to create it once and then copy the cases. Once you have all the cases copied, it is just a matter of changing the velocity in the zero folder and running it as usual. Here's a list of commands I used for reference. In the repo I linked below, the geometry.stl will already be in there, so you can just ignore the first command. Now I will take you through the procedures I used to run each individual case. Here I'll just run an example case. Please remember that I have already created the mesh in this case. I will just let this video run. If you're familiar with my content, all of these steps will be fairly familiar to you. If not, I recommend you watch a previous video of mine. The best one for this is probably my video on how to run open foam in parallel. For post-processing, I created a macro to calculate the forces on the wing. You can read the steps below, or I am just going to quickly show you how to use it on a case I previously ran.
Part 3, Results. Before going into the results from the simulations, I'm going to show you some of the equations used. The first few are for the area and aspect ratio. The aspect ratio, here referred to as AR, but later referred to simply as A, is a bit tricky to calculate as there are a few different methods. Nevertheless, this is the one I used. Here is the formula for the coordinate system transformation. This was used to transform the results from the CFD forces output to the lift and drag forces in the prime coordinate system. And here are some final equations I am certain everyone is familiar with. Okay, so this is the first results slide. It may be a bit difficult to see, but the Excel will be provided in the repository. The most notable takeaway from these plots, besides that they follow the general expected trends, is how the lift curve slope is still linear even after 30 degrees. This seems very abnormal. Is it due to a poor simulation or is this valid behavior? We will find out over the next few slides. Along with experimental data, I compared my results to the following theoretical predictions. If you are interested in the full derivation of this equation, the paper is in the repository. To get the coefficients kv and kp, I used image j and the provided plots to get a best estimate for a equals 0.5 and a equals 1.0. Here you can see the values I calculated from the previous slide. Okay, now the exciting part. On this slide, you can see two plots for A equals 0.5. The one to the left has the experimental and theoretical data, and the one to the right has the theoretical and CFD data. Please ignore the lower line on the first plot, as it only represents CL using potential flow theory. It is interesting to note that the CL values for the CFD appear to diverge down from the theory past 15 degrees. It is hard to determine whether this behavior would also happen in the experimental data, due to the uncertainties and limited AOA ranges available. This slide is the same as the previous one, but for A equals 1.0. Interestingly enough, the CFD values on this plot seem to be much closer to theory. However, we still observe consistently lower lift for the experimental and CFD data compared to the theory. One possibility here is that the vortices on either side for the narrower wing, the A equals 0.5, are interacting and somehow reducing the lift. And for A equals 1, the vortices are separated enough to where they're not interacting and therefore their lift values are much more similar to the theory. It's hard to draw any conclusions because the data is pretty limited. Part 4 Discussion Looking back at this project, the two main improvements I would recommend would be to lower the cell volume ratio between the final inflation layer and the first cell level after that, and to run the simulation on a cloud HPC service. The reason for the first improvement is that I think that for higher AOAs and larger aspect ratios, the velocity gradients will not be fully captured by the inflation layers due to the large vortices above the wing. I believe that having a smoother cell volume transition in this region would greatly improve the results. For more information on this topic, I will link a video down below. The second improvement is recommended to lower the time required to run these simulations. Each of these simulations took around 3 hours. So, 26 total simulations took around 3 full days of computation time on 6 cores. All in, these simulations took over 2 weeks to run, which could be greatly sped up if run on HPC. The final thing is that I think that there is a lot of further exploration possible in this area. One area I am particularly fascinated with is placing propellers in the counter-rotating vortices and exploring the transient behavior of these flows. Keep an eye out, this may be a future video. As always, thanks for watching. Don't forget to subscribe here and on Patreon and share and like my content. As always, please leave any comments or suggestions for future videos in the comment section below and I will do my best to answer everything. Just as a bit of a channel update, I've started working on an Ahmed body simulation, airfoil database generator using OpenFoam, and I'm considering doing a tutorial for calculating a soccer ball trajectory, I guess in the spirit of Euro 2020. Thanks again for watching and goodbye.